Okay, so what means that we have in acquiring a new asset is to use what we call a deferred payment contract. And when we use a deferred payment contract, it's going to be quite similar to what you covered in the prior course, um, thinking about notes receivable, notes payable, bonds payable, and investments. We're going to use the effective interest method in order to amortize premiums and discounts on these notes. And we're going to have to establish the present value because if you recall, even though we're paying cash at a later date, the present value of the cash that we are paying at the later date is the acquisition cost of the asset. We had the same five inputs to the present value calculation that we had before, the payment, the future value, the number of periods, the market adjusted rate of interest for the company that is acquiring the asset because they are the one that is promising the future payment. So it is the company that is acquiring the asset whose market rate of interest that we're interested in. And um, the present value is what we are going to record the asset at because this is the historical acquisition price. So let's look at an example of a note. It's going to exercise some of the skills that you developed in Intermediate 1. This is probably the more tricky, more, one of the more tricky notes because it is a equal installment note. Now I have two conflicting things here. I have five payments at December 31st for the next three years. So let's just call it three payments uh, for the next, uh, each of the end of the year for the next three years. It's a non-interest bearing note. So we don't have a stated payment. We don't have a, our payments um, are going to be zero, except that we do have a payment that occurs at each December year end. So we do have an annuity. Uh, we're looking for the present value. We are have a future value of zero. It's not sixty thousand. 60,000 would be the face value, but we're solving for the future value in this instance. The payments are 20,000. They occur at the end of each year for three years. We have an interest rate of 7% and the number of years then would be three. So if you put all this into your present value calculator, you're gonna get a present value of $52,486. And that would be our present value. So then when you go to record the uh, equipment, you want to record the equipment at that cash equivalent present value. You don't want to worry about the 60,000 because that's a future value. The 60,000, I mean, sorry, not the 60,000 being a future value, the 60,000 is really the face value. And remember, you want to record the note receivable or the note payable at the face value. And then the difference between those two becomes a discount on the note payable itself for $7,514. Now at the end of the first year, we would have a cash payment being made. That cash payment is going to be $20,000. The note payable would be decreased by the cash payment. And then in order to record the amortization of the discount over the year, we would have interest expense that we would recognize as we reduce the discount on the note payable. Remember, we wanna use the effective interest method. And in order to do that, we would take the carrying value of the note at the beginning of the year, 52,486, multiply it by 7%, which would give me $3,674 of interest expense to recognize. My apologies, my allergies started acting up as soon as I got to my house. I don't know what's going on here, but it's a little out of control. Um, now, what is the carry value of the note at the end of the year? The carry value of the note at the end of the year would be a combination of two items. It would be first, the reduction to our note payable. So our note payable had been $60,000 face. We paid off 20 of it. And 
Now there's only 40,000 of it remaining. The other aspect that we need to remember to include in this then is the discount. The discount will lower the face value. The discount began at $7,514. We've reduced it here by $3,674 to bring it down to $3,840. So the carry value at the, of the note at year end would be the face value of the note that's remaining, the $40,000 less the discount, which brings you down to $36,160. Another way to think about it is just taking the present value or the carrying value of that note, 60,000 less 7,514, which gives you 52,486. Adding the amount of the discount we amortized, understanding that as we amortize the discount, we are subtracting less discount and subtracting the face value of the note to yield 36,160. This is a bit of a shortcut method if you understand the arithmetic. I love T accounts and I always uh, advocate their use whenever possible because I feel like they offer a much clearer picture of what's going on. Now, another approach is when you buy multiple assets at the same time and you make a lump sum purchase. And the lump sum purchase is going to be handled a lot like the revenue packages that we examined prior. So what we do is we have a $450,000 price tag for land, building, and fixtures that we purchased all together. Now, we bought them all for $450,000, and perhaps we had an independent appraisal show us you know, what are the fair market value of these items. So their standalone prices would have been $100,000 for a land, $350,000 for the building, $50,000 for the fixtures, which is a total of $500,000. So then what you do is just figure out what uh, percent each of these make up of the total that would be 100,000 divided by 500,000, which is 20%. 350 divided by 500,000, which comes out to 70. Uh, oops, not K, 70%. And then 50,000 divided by 500,000, which comes out to 10% good that these all add up to 100%, right? Because they should. And then we take that and we multiply the price we paid because again, we're interested in the acquisition cost of these items, not their fair market value, but how much we spent to acquire them. We, met, we would multiply each by $450,000. That would yield 90,000. Uh, in this case, 315000 and 45000 And again, you can check this, sum it up. It should be 450000 if you've done it right. And then you can make the journal entry if you wanted that you would record land at 90 k the building at 315000 and fixtures at uh, 45,000 and we gave up, let's say cash for this to make it simple. That would be $450,000 of cash together. It's so that's a lump sum purchase. If we issue stock to acquire a fixed asset, sometimes we can issue equity and this would be an example of a non-cash transaction. Um, what we will typically hang our hat on, if we can, is the market value of the stock issued. Now, this is going to be only when you have an actively traded, publicly traded company. If the stock market value is not determinable, then you would want to get a fair market valuation of the property to serve as a basis for recording the transaction. Um, so let's just assume that we have a liquid stock, a publicly traded, actively traded uh, stock, 
And in that case, we would have a credit to common stock at par. We would uh, value the fixed asset at the fair market value of stock, which would just be the number of shares times the market price of those shares. That would give me the fair market value of the stock. And then your additional paid in capital would be your plug to fill in the gap. So it's essentially like we issued an amount of stock for the price of the land. The price of the land would be proxied by the fact that we have a number of shares times the market price. Uh, we would value the common stock account at par because that's simply what we do. It would be par times the number of shares, of course. And then the additional paid in capital would just be an arithmetic plug. In the opposite case, when we don't have the, um, the, the price of stock as our fair market value, we would have the fixed asset valued. We would get a fair market value for that, and that's what we would debit it at. Then we would have common stock, and this is still at par, so it would just be the number of shares that we issued times the par value. And even if you're not publicly traded, typically stock has par value. Um, if it doesn't, then everything would go into common stock. If it does have a par value, then again, your additional paid in capital is going to be the plug. Right. Non-reciprocal transfers simply indicate that you don't give anything or you don't get anything for giving up an asset. Okay, so we either have a non-reciprocal transfer into the company because we have a donation or a contribution, or we give something um, that would be a disposition. We'll talk about that in a second. But this occurs just from donations when our, for example, say our company gets something. Um, for the acquisition, we would want to use the fair market value of the asset in order to record this, and the corresponding credit would be what we call contribution revenue. Um, it's a non-operating revenue event. So it wouldn't go in our operating revenues or our operating expenses. It would be a non-operating item. And if it's a donation, the flip side of this, then we would record a contribution expense. But the idea, of course, is here that we want the fair market value of the asset that we recorded uh, because we can't do the acquisition price. The acquisition price is zero, so we go to the fair market value instead, and then we record contribution revenue for the same amount. Forgot it was on the next page, <laughs> so I didn't really need that. So let's talk about a few dispositions. Disposition is when we dissolve an asset, get rid of it. Um, in terms of a donation, record the donation at the book value, just removing it, um, and the contribution expense would be uh, just that book value of whatever asset we're giving up. So it would be the contribution expense for an amount we would debit any accumulated depreciation with that asset and record the a credit to the historical cost of the asset. We wouldn't worry about the fair market value of it in this case because recording it at a fair market value would cause uh, a gain or loss to occur. And that's not gonna happen when, we've, um, when we're already recording the expense because we're just giving the asset up. So it's contributions expense, just like we recorded contributions revenue in the prior, a non-operating expense. If we sell a fixed asset for cash, we're gonna have uh, a slightly different, I don't know why these got all off kilter here. My X's are not lining for my debits and credits. Whenever we sell a fixed asset, one thing you want to make sure is that you update the depreciation to the day of sale. Um, 
the last from the last date that depreciation was assessed. So for example, if we made an adjustment for depreciation at the end of December of the prior year, we're going to want to, and we're selling it say in March, we want to update the depreciation for January and February so that we have the appropriate book value on the day of the sale. After you've done that, you remove the cost of the asset, so the fixed asset at its historical cost. You remove the accumulated depreciation associated with that asset, record any cash received, and then, of course, record a gain or a loss depending on what you have left over. It would always be the sale price of what you are uh, transferring less the book value. If the sale price is greater than that book value, then you would record a gain. If the sale price is less than the book value, then you would have a loss. Sometimes we have what we call an involuntary conversion. This is just when something happens, fire theft, fire theft, flood. We want to update the depreciation to the day of the disposition and recognize a gain or a loss um, between what we, you know, the credited assets that we that have been destroyed and any amount that's recovered. So. I do an example of that here, where we have the book value of a storage warehouse being 100,000. The book value of any asset is its historical cost less the accumulated depreciation. I say that that was um, 100,000 on January 1st. I say on March 2nd, 2014, a fire destroyed the warehouse and its contents. The book value of, ass of the asset at that date was 90,000. So. Here we have a book value going from 100 to 90. If only time has passed and I haven't told you anything else, then you should assume that that implies we have additional accumulated depreciation. So we have that going on. Um, I say that we have a $200,000 of inventory in this warehouse when the fire broke out. Um, we received an insurance check for 200,000 covering both the inventory in the warehouse and $10,000 of inventory was able to be recovered and deemed usable. So what do we got going on here? We have, um, what have we lost? You know, what, what do we have to account for? So one thing that we have to remove from the books is the warehouse. And remember, the warehouse had a historical cost of 450000 It had accumulated depreciation of three fifty dollars at the beginning of the year, but if the book value went from $100 to $90, that must mean that its accumulated depreciation increased to three hundred and sixty dollars to give me that book value of $90,000. We had... $200,000 of inventory. We were able to recover $10,000 of inventory. And so that yields $190,000 of inventory lost. We also got a check. So then what we want to do is just create a journal entry that would show the loss of the warehouse, the loss of the inventory. We would credit the warehouse for its historical cost of $450,000. We would want to debit all of the accumulated depreciation associated with the warehouse that would be 360,000. So we've now effectively removed the book value of 90,000. We would want to reduce my inventory account by 190,000 and record cash because we received an insurance check of 200,000. So we didn't get everything, but we did get some money back. And now we have to decide, well, do we have a gain or loss on the transaction? By the way that I wrote the journal entry, you can assume it's a loss. So this, of course, would be 640000 Here we have five sixty, And so we have a loss uh, from fire. This would have probably one time qualified as an extraordinary item as long as fires were not prevalent in the area, but we no longer record extraordinary items. So this would simply be a non-operating 
loss. Unless, you know, fires were just a part of the ongoing operations of the firm, right? And then it would be an expense, an operating expense, but that's just not, that's just being stupid. All right. So let's talk about exchanges, assets for assets. This is a non-monetary exchange. And assets for assets have a lot of rules. If you try to memorize them all, you're probably not going to succeed here. It's going to be, or if you do, it's going to be a lot more painful than it needs to be. I'm just going to line up my X's down here. They just got all wonky again from cutting and pasting them. I'm not sure exactly why. Um, so when we exchange one asset for another asset, the rule of thumb is we want to record the new fixed asset at the fair market of the fair market value of the asset we're giving up, the old asset. So that's the asset we are giving up. Or the fair market value of the new asset, the asset that we are receiving. Whichever is easier to determine. Um, now, when we do this, if we're using the fair market value of the old asset to value the new asset, then we have to consider whether we exchange any cash for that asset. So if we exchange some cash for that asset, it's going to affect the value of the new asset. So for example, if I give you an asset and I have to give you $1,000 on top of that, what does that mean about the value of what you're giving me? It means essentially that your asset is worth my old asset plus $1,000. So if we pay cash as part of the transaction, we have to add that cash paid to the old fair market value, right? If I'm giving you my car, and, um, you, if I'm giving you my car at $1,000 and you're giving me just your car in exchange, that means your car essentially is worth my car plus the $1,000, right? So I would value what I got, your car, at the price of my old car plus the $1,000 that I gave up. If we receive cash, the opposite logic applies, right? If we receive cash, then that means that what I am getting is worth less than what I'm giving up. If I'm giving you my car, and in order to make the transaction palatable to me, you give me your car plus a thousand, that means my car's worth more. So in order to value what I've gotten from you, I would take the value of my old car and subtract a thousand dollars. If we're going by the fair market value of the new fixed asset, then we don't worry about what we've paid or received in cash. We can just record the exchange at the value of the new fixed asset. So that's the first part, valuing the new fixed asset. Now, calculating a gain or loss on exchange, let me tell you, the gain or loss on exchange is solely dependent on the old fixed asset has absolutely nothing to do with the new fixed asset. So I can give you a problem and not tell you anything about a new fixed asset. And as long as you have information about the book value of the old fixed asset and its fair market value, you can tell me whether there's a gain or a loss. So there's going to be a loss if the fair market value of the old fixed asset that I'm giving up is less than its book value. And you think of it as sort of fact checking your book value. If I have an asset that I'm giving up and it's uh, has a book value of ten thousand dollars, and its fair market value ends up being seven thousand, well, my book value at ten thousand is overstating the true value of that asset by three thousand dollars, right? In that case, we had the book value of 10K versus the fair market value of 7K. Well, it's like I sold a book value of 10,000 for $7,000 cash. That results in a $3,000 loss. Right? Anytime that you have a loss or anytime this occurs, with an exchange, you record the loss regardless of what happens, regardless of any other facts. 
Now, it's the opposite case for a gain. If the book value is less than the fair market value, then it's as if I'm trading my car and its fair market value is 13000 well, then I can record a $3,000 gain. Now, whether I record this gain becomes dependent on a couple of things. Whether we have commercial substance, if we have commercial substance, then we can recognize the gain. What is commercial substance? It simply means that the future cash flows of our business are going to change based on the exchange we just made. If no, then you have to ask a second question. Was cash paid or received? If cash was paid, no gain. If cash was received, then yes, at least some gain. And we're gonna look at that more in just a second, but that's the basic fallout. We record a gain if there's commercial substance, regardless. So if the future cash flows are gonna change because of the exchange, we wanna record this $3,000 gain. If their future cash flows are not gonna change, we don't have commercial substance, then we have to assess whether we paid cash. If we paid some cash, think of it as a losing proposition. Um, it's not 100% solid intuition, but it works to some degree, no gain. If we receive some cash, then we do have some gain. We do have some financial flow coming in. And so we can record at least some gain and I'll tell you how we determine whether we're gonna record all of it or some of it, all right? So this is a very large template. It's almost too confusing. I almost wanna take it out because I feel like it intimidates people. But um, uh, you know, part of it is that you know, I either debit cash if I receive some boot or receive it in the transaction or I credit cash, not both are, both are not gonna happen. And I'm either going to have a gain or a loss. I'm not going to have both. It just depends on the fair market value of the old asset versus the book value of the old asset. Okay. So we're going to use the fair market value of the assets unless something occurs. Like I said up here, we're going to use the fair market value of the old asset or the new asset, whichever one is more determinable. The only time we're going to not follow this rule is if the fair value of neither the asset received nor given up is determinable, that's rare. The exchange transaction is used to facilitate a sale to customers, common in certain industries. So think about when you go to buy a car, you don't like the color on the lot, and they say, well, we can bring one in from another dealer, they can trade too, but this is just a facilitative sale this is not really changing the future cash flows. Yes, I understand it's facilitating a sale, um, so they will make the sale, but it's not considered commercial substance. And if the exchange lacks commercial substance, so if we don't have a change in the future cash flows, we wanted to use the fair market value unless one of these occurs. If one of these does occur, then we base the new fixed asset, that's what the FA is, it might not be readily um, identifiable, on the book value of the old fixed asset and then subtract any boot that we pay, um, or I'm sorry, add any boot that we've paid or subtract any boot we've received. Okay. Like I said, Commercial substance is when future cash flows change significantly as a result of the change, as a result of the switch. We recognize all losses and all gains when there is commercial substance because that service life difference indicates commercial substance. And then we go into this rubric of understanding when to, re when to record a gain. We always recognize a loss even when there is no commercial substance. Um, if no cash is exchanged, no gain is recorded. If we pay cash, no gain. If we receive some cash, 
we decide what is the amount of cash in proportion to everything we received. Okay, we calculate this ratio. If the ratio is greater than 25%, recognize the entire gain. If it's less than 25%, then take whatever the ratio is, whatever that net percent is less than 25%, multiply it by the total gain. And then the value of the new fixed asset is going to be the fair value of the new asset, which is based on the book value of the old asset plus the gain. Okay, We will go over this in these problems and we will figure out what's going on specifically with these items. I will pick it up in the next video and we will head into interest capitalization shortly.